Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to Market Insights, uh, which is presented by International Market Centers. Um, International Market Centers, or IMC, is the center of commerce for furniture, gift, home decor, and apparel industries. Um, we bring buyers and sellers together from all over the world um, through physical markets and virtual. We also do virtual programming for the time being until we can get together in groups on site again, hopefully later this year. Today, our webinar is with uh, Linda Holt from Linda Holt Creative, and it is Smartphone Tips to Elevate Your Brand. This is CEU accredited, so those who registered through Zoom I'll send you the information after the presentation. And if you're viewing through social media, welcome. And if you have any questions, you can email me. I'm Kimberly Porter, the Senior Programming Manager for IMC. And uh, my email is kporter at imcenters.com. We're ready to learn all about smartphone uh, photography. So Linda, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kim. So welcome, everybody. I am so happy that you're here. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are from. And I know your time is very valuable. So I've tried to create a really value filled presentation for you all today. And we are going to be going over seven smartphone photo tips to elevate your brand. And I'm going to go through each of these, but I'm going to just quickly going to show you um, how you can use your smartphone more like a DSLR camera, uh, tips for getting your line straight, a few tips for mastering lighting and composition, the importance of checking your background, and the importance of posting photos that represent your brand. And then finally, I'm going to talk about editing. So before we get into that, I want to just briefly introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. As Kim said, my name is Linda Holt and I live right outside of Boston. And I was a professional photographer before 20, for 25 years before I went back to school in 2008 for interior design. I opened up Linda Holt Creative in 2011 and I um, have been a smartphone photographer since 2014. I also am the creator of uh, design interior design focused smartphone photography classes and editing classes. And I am super easy to reach. You can get me pretty much anywhere at Linda Holt Creative. So I would love it if you want to connect with me um, on any of these, especially Instagram. All right. So my background was I was a headshot photographer, even though today I primarily am doing interiors in my work. Um, and this is sort of a representation of what I did all of those years. I shot um, over 5,000 actors, models, singers, and other celebrities. I did some fashion work, including a men's, I had a men's underwear line that I shot the box covers for. I worked with some Boston um, fashion designers. And just as a fun little um, bit of trivia, that gentleman you see on the left-hand side is Robert Ballard, and he is standing on his boat down at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and Robert Ballard discovered the final resting place of the Titanic. So that was a, a fun day for me. Now, during all of those years as a photographer, what you see on the left is just a small sample of what it took for me to make a good photo. I had multiple cameras, many lenses, light stands, booms, backgrounds, light meters, reflectors, and I had a big studio that was very expensive that had to house everything. Fast forward to today, all of that equipment is gone. In fact, I no longer even own a DSLR camera and I shoot exclusively with my smartphone and I use both an, I use both an iPhone and a Samsung and I use them both. And the amazing thing about the phone is today especially it is such a powerful tool, the camera that I can get just a good photo almost in most cases even better on my um, smartphone than I did with all of that equipment that I had in the studio all those years ago. Now, you might think that when I started with my iPhone that my photos would look pretty good. Um, I had been a photographer for 25 years. I knew everything about composition and lighting, but that was so far from the case. <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and embarrass myself and I wanna show you my early smartphone photos. And they looked like this. They were 
very tragically sad. They were dark, they were crooked, many of them were out of focus. I had no idea what I was doing. I was using my smartphone as a point and shoot camera and you can see the results. I, um, it, I just didn't know how to use it. And at the time I was still a pretty big DSLR camera snob. So I never once thought it was my problem that my photos looked like this. I just blamed the camera. And I still see people today blaming their camera by hashtagging their photos on Instagram as hashtag crappy cell phone photo. <clears throat> Once you learn to use your camera, you will never get a crappy cell phone uh, shot again, and you shouldn't. So I went on like 2000, probably 14, 15, 16, even 2017, just getting really bad shots. So I hardly ever used the camera and I was still lugging around my heavy camera with multiple lenses. And then I had almost what I can say is a life-changing experience. I was at a design seminar and they had a professional photographer speaking about how to get better photos with your iPhone. And on the screen behind her were a whole series of shelter magazine covers. There was Coastal Living and Martha Stewart and Country Cottage. And they were beautiful, beautiful photos. And she told us that she had taken every single one with her iPhone. Well, I went home from that conference so determined to figure this out and figure out the camera because I knew if she did it, I could certainly learn how to do it. So I read every blog I could find about getting better photos. I, um, I bought to, I watched YouTube tutorials. I bought three or four different uh, classes about it. And the classes were great, but what I found out was that and they didn't really apply as much to my needs as an interior designer. You know, they talked about the rule of thirds and leading lines. So it did take me a while to figure this all out. But today I'm actually proud to show you what my iPhone photos look like because I've cracked the code and now they look like this. So in this um, presentation, I'm gonna give you my absolute best tips of how sort of the cliff notes of everything I've learned over the last um, three to four years to get better shots. All right, so let's get started. Tip number one, you, I wanna show you how you can use your smartphone so it's more like a DSLR camera. And there's two things about the smartphone that can, can get you to this level. Number one, you need to manually learn how to set the um, exposure and the focus. And number two, you want to use the portrait mode or telephoto lens on your camera if you have one, because that's what really separates uh, the professional level, level cameras from the smartphones, is that professionals have these long lenses so they can get that nice blurred background. But if you've upgraded your phone within the last two or three years, you will also have that capability. So I'm going to show you first on the smartphone for any of you that don't know how to do this. To set the exposure um, on the iPhone, there's two ways you can do it. You can either tap your finger on your camera screen exactly where you want the light meter to expose. And it, when you tap it, it will say expose here. And then everything else will, will go accordingly, either lighter or darker. But where you tap your finger should be perfectly exposed according to the AI of the iPhone. If you do that and you still think the photo looks too dark or too light, you can control it even further by holding your finger there until you see a yellow box with a little yellow sun icon appear off to the right. Then simply by sliding your finger up the screen, you'll lighten the image. And if you scroll your finger down the screen, you will darken the image. You should get in the habit of setting the exposure manually pretty much every time you shoot. So you'll never end up with photos that are too dark or too light. If you own um, an Android, I know a lot of you that have Androids have a Samsung. It's a very similar um, sort of function. You tap your finger on the screen, you'll see a yellow circle. That again will tell the camera, this is where I want you to expose for. And then you can further adjust it. There's a um, little line that will be below the yellow circle. It might be a little hard to see in the slide, but you can slide this for, for further control to either the left or the right. And if you scroll it, your finger to the right on the screen, you'll lighten the image. 
And if you scroll your finger or swipe your finger to the left of the screen, you will darken the image. So it's very easy to learn both this um, with the iPhone and the Samsung. And to manually set the focus, it's a very similar thing. With the iPhone, you tap on the screen until you see that yellow box, but you hold your finger there for a second or two. And at the top of your phone, you'll see a yellow indicator and it'll say AE AF lock. That means auto exposure, auto focus lock. That means if this is what you want in focus, say this phase, things in the background you don't care about, these will be blurry. Had I wanted to make sure the background was in focus, I would have done the same thing tapped here and then the foreground might have gone out of focus. Same thing with the Samsung. That yellow circle where you tap for exposure is also where it will lock the focus. So in this case, I locked the focus on this um, pot, but had I wanted to have the chair or the pillow in the background a little bit sharper, I would have tapped and held there until the yellow circle came up. Now, you might not think this is a big deal, but I'm going to tell you where I use this all the time. If I'm shooting a longer room and I want to get the whole room in, but I might want the draperies and nice sharp focus at the back of the room, I will tap my finger and set the um, set the focus on the drapery. And then if things are a little soft in the foreground, I don't care. I'll still get the overall feel of the room, but those draperies in the back will be in nice, sharp focus. And then sim similarly, if I wanted to have maybe a, um, the sofa in the foreground with the pillows in sharp focus and not worry so much about what's going on as the room, you look farther into the room, then I would lock it in the foreground. So it's a really valuable tool. And of course, a professional or with a DSLR camera, number one, they're always going to manually set their um, exposure and they're always going to manually set the focus. So if you do those two things, you're, you're doing what you would be doing if you had a DSLR camera. All right, number two, when you can, try and shoot, get in the habit of shooting in either portrait mode or telephoto. Now, again, this is for those of you that's, that have upgraded your phone within the last couple of years. And one thing that really sets a professional photo apart from an amateur photo or um, a specifically a smartphone photo is the professional will always blur their background or often blur the background. Now, the problem with all smartphones, no matter what model you have, the regular lens is a wide lens. If you know about um, telephoto lens with DSLR cameras, the standard lens on the smartphone is about a 28 millimeter. Now that's considered a pretty wide angle lens. So if you look at the photo on the left, this was um, taken with this standard lens and everything in the image is in focus. All the china is in focus all the way to the back of the table. The artwork in the back is in focus. There's a bunch of clutter in the background of the shop that's, that you can you know, still see versus simply by putting my phone in portrait mode, it's a much nicer shot. It looks just like a professional took that shot. The foreground is in focus. As your eye travels to the background, it's blurred. Um, we don't need to see all that extra stuff in the background, like the artwork and whatever's happening um, over here to the right. What we care about is this. So I use portrait mode. I don't do a lot of portraits, but I use portrait mode all the time. If I'm at a trade show and I'm shooting in somebody's booth and I want to get a, you know, a nice shot of some accessories on a table, shoot in portrait mode. It's going to make it look more professional. And if you don't have portrait mode, or you, even if you do, some, a similar thing you can do is bump up to the telephoto. So um, the iPhone, if you have the newer one, has the regular lens, and then the telephoto is a 2.5x, and the Samsung is a 3x, meaning that it's a longer lens, and it's an optical lens, so you can stand back farther and get that sort of same feel of um, a professional-looking photo. All right, let's move on. Tip number two, you want to hold your phone correctly and you want to turn on your grid. <clears throat> now you might think holding the phone, you just point and shoot, but that is the wrong way to hold it. So let me go over the correct way. 
you always want to have your phone on the same level as what you're photographing. So in other words, you don't want to be holding your phone up at chest level or eye level like most, most people hold it and then aim down at what you're shooting. So look at the photo on the left. This was taken at high point. I wanted to get this little vignette with his chest. And the first one I took, I'm standing up tall and I'm, I am tall, I'm 5'10", but I had to angle my phone down a little bit to photograph this. And you can see what happens. And again, this goes back to the camera's wide angle standard lens. And a wide angle lens will tend to make your lines either converge or diverge. So the perspective looks really funny in this. The um, lines up here are very wide at the top of the artwork, and then everything starts going inward as the eye travels to the bottom of the photo. This photo on the right, I got down um, and held my phone at about waist level. Now my phone is on the same plane as what I'm photographing. Look at how the difference in my lines. They're nice and straight. I have no perspective problems. Now, if you get a photo like this, you can always go into an editing app and fix the perspective. But why do that? Just get in the habit of making sure your phone isn't tipped down, that it's nice and flat and it's straight on to what you're shooting. And that is just that simple um, thing of holding your phone in the correct level is going to up level your photos just by doing that. Here's another example. And this time I used red dots to indicate um, I was standing up tall and the camera lens was probably at about this level. So again, I'm shooting down and look what happened to that little furniture vignette. Again, everything is distorted. The perspective is off. It's wide at the top and everything starts narrowing down. In fact, look at the line of the doorway here. It's going right inward. I got on my hands and knees. I had the camera lens centered right about there, which is on the same plane and level as what I'm shooting. Look at the difference. We've got nice straight lines. We have no perspective problems. That little um, chest of drawers, the legs are nice and straight. So again, I didn't have to go into editing and fix it. It's so simple. Just hold your phone on the same level as what you're shooting. And at high point, you might get tired by the end of the day if you're shooting a lot of furniture or if you're at market. But again, just get down, hold your phone down low. So both of these, there's, there's very little um, perspective problems and they look nice, um, nice clean lines because I had my camera at a low level. Now, one thing you can do to aid in knowing if your camera is perfectly level is to turn on your in-camera grid. And to do that, you just go into your settings, scroll down to you find camera, click on camera, and no matter what camera you have, every smartphone ever made has a grid. And when you scroll down to camera, click on camera, and then scroll down to you find grid and toggle on grid so you, it'll be a green when you turn it on, a green button. And you will have a grid that will be on your camera screen every time you go to take a photo. Now, it's not going to show on your photos. It's just going to be on the camera screen. And the grid is a set of two horizontal and two vertical lines. And what you can do is line up one of your grid lines on the camera screen to something that you know in your photo is perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical. So here's a little test I did to show you the difference. Um, the photo on the left, I actually took this out uh, from my car window. I turned the grid off and I, I really did think I had my phone pretty level, but obviously you can see I did not. The buildings look like they're sort of leaning over to the left. The perspective is off. It's not a very good photo. I turned the grid back on and then I lined some of these lines, like this line. I was trying to line up to the edge of these windows because I knew that was a straight line. This horizontal one, I tried to line up to the top of this building here below the cupola and look at the difference. One looks architecturally correct, the lines are straight. The other one is not architecturally correct and it looks like the buildings are about to fall over to the left. Now, 
not only with architecture, these lines come in um, in handy, but I use them for everything. Whether I'm shooting a landscape, I'll line up the horizon line with it. And if you're at market, almost everything you can find there will have something you can use one of the lines. So for example, you could use the top of this bed frame or the sides of the mirror here, or here we have multiple things you could line up to, to one of these lines. We've got two horizontal lines here, even the horizontal lines here. But this was going to make a big difference in your photos to have your line straight. And your lines won't be straight until you're holding your phone in the correct way. All right, moving right along, let's get into tip number three. And I want to give you a few tips for mastering lighting. You want to time your shoot. You want to turn off the lights when you're shooting an interior. And when you can't turn off the lights, you want to expose for the highlights. So let's talk about each of one of those. First thing that's really important, especially if you're shooting an interior, is you want to time your shoot. And as counterintuitive as this sounds, you want to shoot an interior with natural light, but not just any natural light. You want even natural light. And timing is everything. And you want to time your shoot for when the light looks the most even. So if you've ever worked with a professional photographer, an interior photographer, and they're coming in to do your, your room, they're always, or they should if they're good, they're going to ask you about the lighting because they want to know the time of the day that's going to be best to photograph your space. What they don't want ever to have to work with and what you don't want ever to have to work with is hard direct sunlight streaming through the window, casting hot spots on your furniture, um, across the floor. So let me show you an example of that. When you shoot with hard light, you get a situation like this. So you have two choices. You can either tap your finger on the phone screen to expose for the shadows, or you can tap your finger on, the, on your camera screen and expose for the highlights. Neither is going to give you a good photo. So if you look at the photo on the left, I tapped probably right about here on the um, table base, but look what happened. The, the highlights, completely blown out, terrible photo. If I decide, well, I'll tap my finger here on the window and tell the camera to expose for the highlights, the rest of the image has gone perfectly, um, has gone dark. And there's no bringing those shadows back or those highlights back. It's just too contrasty to even fix that in editing. So this um, scenario, this is actually my little dining nook. It looks like this almost all day long. It's a southeast facing window. And on a sunny day from about nine in the morning until about three in the afternoon, I have sun coming in that window. But simply by timing the shoot till around, I going to show you on the next slide, it was about 4.30 in the afternoon, the difference. Same shot, same space. I did style because I did a different day, but this is at about 4.30 in the afternoon. It's still bright enough in the room. I'm still using natural light, but it's even natural light. I have no hard contrasty light that I'm fighting with um, trying to figure out how to photograph. And you know, people think the smartphone, it's their pro it's a smartphone's problem with this. <clears throat> a DSLR camera can't deal with that kind of lighting either. So even if you have a professional and they're forced to shoot in that situation, they have to bring in screens that they'll put outside behind the window to block some of the light. They'll bring in <clears throat> strobes and umbrellas and softbox to try to balance the light. And it's a lot of work. And nobody wants to light a space like that. So look, time your shoot for when it's nice even natural light. Number two, <clears throat> turn off the lights when you're shooting an interior. <clears throat> Once you have blown out hot spots from the lights, there's no bringing that back in editing. There's no information there. So by turning on your interior lights, you're not going to get a shot that you're going to want to use that's going to represent your brand. Um, you're just going to get bright white hot circles, glare, all sorts of problems when you turn on the light. So turn off the light, wait until you get that nice, bright, natural light. Now, there's a lot of situations that designers and or anyone that's visiting trade shows, 
finds themselves in, you can't turn off the lights. You can't walk into a vendor's booth and say, oh, I want to photograph your this vignette here. Would you mind turning off all the booth lights for me? I mean, obviously that isn't going to happen. Same thing occurs when you go to um, a show house, you know, or trade shows and showrooms. You have to deal with the worst lighting you will ever come into contact with. There's fluorescent lights overhead, there's spotlights, there's multiple temperatures of all the bulbs. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you what you can do in these next few slides to the, the best way to, to, to deal with it. There's no perfect solution, but I'm going to show you what you can do. And I'm just we're going to start off showing you this is a show house at the Kip Space Show House. When you're not able to turn off the lights, you always want to expose for the highlights. The reason is you can usually lighten up shadows in editing um, if it's not too dark, but you can never bring back highlights. Once the highlights are blown out, there is no saving them. So if you look at this image, um, this slide, this is how my camera took um, my smartphone took the shot. It was a point and shoot. The camera is going to want to expose for the largest amount of ambient light or the largest in the photo, which is the room itself. But look what happens to the lamp when it does that. It just goes, you know, bright white, no bringing it back. So you have to, again, override the in-camera light meter. You want to tap your finger on the light because I know I can bring this back eventually in editing. So by tapping my finger on the light, I told the camera light meter, expose here. Don't worry about the rest of it. You can do work on that later. And then this is what the image looked like after I exposed for the light. And then in editing afterwards, it was no big deal to bring back all the darkness in selective editing and the light now is is still there um, and it's you know a much much better image let me show you um, a couple of things from a high point again this is somebody's showroom and <clears throat> the, the photo on the left is how my phone took it just by pointing and shooting it blew out all of the highlights so this hanging pendant here there's no detail in it the table lamps on either side of the bed are blown out, which causes the artwork to be, you know, blown out. So again, I told my um, camera light meter, uh, expose here because I tapped on the pendant. And by doing that, everything went a little bit dark, but I was able to just easily lighten the photo in editing. And you can see the difference. And I think blown out highlights is probably the number one mistake I see people making when they're at a trade show or something like this. They don't know that they should expose for the highlight. So tap your finger on the highlight, expose for the highlight, and then in editing, you can lighten up the image, but you won't lose the detail. And look at this pretty detail in this hanging pendant. It would be, you know, sad to lose that. Even if you're just posting on social media, it's just going to be a nice, a nicer shot. And of course, the extreme of this example is if you're actually photographing lighting in somebody's showroom. Um, you don't want the light to be so blown out, especially if you're trying to photograph the light, maybe to show a client. So you would tap your finger. You know, in this image, I would probably, I probably tapped my finger there. And in this one, I tapped it. So I can still see all the detail in this beautiful glass chandelier and in these fun bulbs here by exposing for the highlights. All right, let's move on to tip number four. I want to give you a few smartphone composition tips when you're shooting um, interiors. Number one, you want to shoot, if you can, in one point composition. You want to make sure your photo is balanced and you want to fill the frame. So let's look. So one point composition you may or may not heard of, but one point composition simply means you are shooting straight onto your subject. And two point composition is you're shooting your subject on an angle, usually into a corner. Now, the problem again, with a smartphone is that wide angle lens. So by shooting straight on and having your phone held in the correct position and using your grid to line up those horizontal and vertical lines, you're going to get a better technical shot. If you are trying to shoot in two-point composition with a smartphone, you will always have 
always perspective problems. There may be times you need to shoot in two point. Maybe the room is too small to get back far enough to shoot in one point. But just know if you shoot in two point composition, because of that wide angle lens, you're not going to be able to line up your lines to get it straight. You're going to have to go into editing and fix the perspective in editing. Let's look at another example. Again, photo on the left, this little vignette in a showroom. I had my phone held on the same plane as that vanity. I was shooting straight on. All I did was shift myself to the um, left, shot at an angle, and you can see the difference with two-point composition. Look at these lines. Again, they start off wide. They're going in. The vanity is, is a little bit off. Um, so if you, if you can, you will get a better shot with your smartphone shooting in one point composition. And if you spend some time looking at shelter magazines, this is a fun little um, thing you can do. Notice in the images, I read a statistic that 95% of photos in, the, in shelter magazines are shot in one point composition. And if you're gonna be posting these on social media, it's also the viewer will, um, it'll, it'll appeal more to the viewer if it's just straight on and they can see what, what they are looking at in one point composition. Oh, I should say two point composition is what realtors shoot in. They always shoot in two point composition because they wanna show you know the whole room, they wanna show how big it is. And we all know how we feel about real estate photography when it comes to our work. So that's the big difference. The one point composition is how designers like their room shot, two-point composition is how realtors like to shoot. All right, my second tip for composition is make sure your photo is balanced. Now, as creatives and people in the, you know, design industry, we generally have a really good eye to know if something is balanced or not. Um, so don't be afraid to move things around. Um, if you're at a vendor's booth, just ask permission and then, sit, you know, put it right back. But here's an example of a showroom. Um, if you look at the image on the left, that's the actual setup. Now to me, this image is not balanced. That chair, my eye goes directly to that chair and it kind of stops my eye. Um, and it's, it just feels heavily weighted in this corner. But simply by opening this up, angling the chair a little bit, it's just, and pushing this over, now my eye is drawn in to this vignette. It's not being stopped at this chair. I can see the whole space. So just by balancing out my image, um, again, you're drawing the viewer in. And, you know, you might not even notice it when you're taking the photo, but all you have to do is take, after you take it, take a quick peek at your um, camera screen. And if your eye goes directly to something and it doesn't look quite right, take the few moments to fix it there. Move something out of the way. You know, professionals, and again, if you've worked with a professional, they have no qualms about moving things every which way. Oftentimes they'll move things so the room would be unlivable if the furniture was in that um, arrangement. They will, you know, put chairs blocking doorways. They'll move tables up against, you know, touching a bookcase. They'll do whatever it takes because it's all about the photo. Then, you know, obviously they move everything back. So keep that in mind when you're shooting. Last tip I want to tell you, especially if you're shooting for social media, <clears throat> fill the frame. You want to have your viewer have a clearly defined focal point or something they're looking at so there isn't a lot of distractions going around. <clears throat> Besides shooting without um, exposing for the highlights, I think the other most common mistake I see people make is they put too much in their photo. There's too much background. There's, you know, just get right in and get in tight, show the viewer what you want to show them. And don't worry about all that extra stuff. And if you happen to shoot, you know, with too much extraneous stuff in the background and, you know, you see things that don't need to be there, then use your crop tool. That can be your <clears throat> best tool for, you know, really zooming in close. And again, this would be a great time to use your portrait mode if you want things a little bit blurred going in the background as I did in this photo in the middle. <clears throat> but on social media, especially, think about it, you know, the viewer 
is looking at social media on their phone. They have about a two or three inch area of real estate. And if you don't capture their attention and you're showing a busy whole room or vignette or something um, from a trade show or from your client's home, they're just going to scroll on by. So don't be afraid to crop in close or get in close and really fill the frame. Here's the next slide is going to show two examples of you know, I pulled both of these off of um, Instagram. I have no idea with a photo on the left what I'm supposed to be looking at. Is it the ottoman in the foreground? Is it the that really interesting table um, with the, the things on it? Or is it maybe those beautiful colored hanging pendants? There's just too much going on. So the eye doesn't know where to look. And same thing with the one on the right. There's a lot of um, extraneous things that don't need to be in the photo. There's a, a animal print rug here. There's part of a piece of furniture here. There's a dresser here with some things on it. So my eye gets like all stopped here when really the focal point is probably way back here. So again, before you take your photo, just think, what is the focal point of this? What do I want viewers to see? when they look at this shot. And if you can't answer it, then your viewer is not going to know what they should be looking at either. All right, tip number five. It is so important to get in the habit of checking your background. These are two more images. Again, I took them right off of Instagram and I hope the people are not listening to this <laughs> webinar because um, I don't mean to embarrass them, but I figured since they posted on Instagram, it was public anyway. All right, so this is the problem. When we are focused on a subject matter, the human eye will tend to not pay attention to anything else outside of what we're focused on. And this is actually encoded in our DNA, believe it or not. So it was a survival technique way back as man was evolving off the savanna, as they were focused on, say, their prey and they're hunting it down. If they were distracted by, you know, the wind blowing the grasses or a bird's flying overhead or maybe a, a, an animal, you know, running through that they weren't interested in, if they kept changing their focus and seeing everything around them, they would have quickly lost sight of their prey and they would have starved. But those early humans that could filter out all the other surrounding distractions, visual distractions, they got the food and they survived. So I am positive these photographers, that whoever they were that took these photos, did not intend for that man to look like he was about to be beamed up to another planet, nor do I think he said to that guy, oh, stand there because there's a palm tree growing out of your head and there's a happy couple taking a selfie to your right and there's some balled up something, coat, um, on the bench behind you. I am positive both of these photographers did not see any of that because they were focused on their subject matter. They were looking at their faces. They were looking at their smile. They were making sure they were in focus. They were thinking about all the things they needed to think about to take a photo, but they never looked at the background. So this happens all the time. So this is something else that you, this is just takes practice. And as a photographer now, I, I can notice a penny on the opposite side of the room on the floor because, you know, over, you know, 60 years, I've been training my eye to see every single detail. But if you're not a professional photographer and your eye is not that trained, you are not going to see these distractions. So try and get in the habit of looking ahead of time at the background. But if you forget, just take a moment, take a very quick look at the camera screen and just see if there's a light coming out of someone's head or a tree or there's a plant that looks like it's growing out of your, you know, the back of your chair. And then before you let them leave or before you walk away, move yourself a foot to the left or a foot to the right or ask your subject to move. Because had either of these photographers ask their subject to just move a foot to the left on either of them, they would have had a photo that would have been a much, well, it wouldn't have been as funny photo. So 
get in the habit of checking your background. It's just, it can really make the difference between, you know, a really amateur looking photo and a more professional photo, which is what we all want to reflect our brand. All right, tip number six, try and post images on your social media that reinforce your brand, especially when you're at a trade show or you know, you're at market. So my brand, as you can immediately see, I love color, I love pattern, I love texture. So I'm drawn to these things. And this is what I post on my feed. But you know, if you are minimalist or you like, you know, lots of neutrals and whites, and you're more like a McGee and company, um, you know, then that's what you're gonna want to focus on because sometimes we get a little overwhelmed when we go to, you know, these trade shows and we're photographing everything. But think about your brand. I mean, take photos of everything. But as you're getting ready to post on your social media, you want to post things so people, when they're looking at your Instagram feed, they're immediately going to get a feeling of who you are, what your brand is, you know, what your product look like if, looks like if you're selling something, what your style is. So again, it's something just to think about as far as when you're, when you're shooting. And moving to my last tip, you need to learn how to use a few editing apps. There's sort of three legs to getting a really good photo. There's composition, there's lighting, and there's editing. There is not a professional out there who would ever post an unedited image. They always go into post-production and with Photoshop or whatever app they use, they are fixing their photo. So it's not just smartphone users that need to correct their photos. Professionals do too. Um, and it's so easy now because there are um, apps that you can do your editing right on your phone. Now, back in the day when I was working as a professional, I had to edit all my photos. I was shooting people. They didn't want, you know, any kind of lines on their faces or too many lines or and back then, I mean, we're talking the early days, way before digital, it was film. I had to send out the prints. I had to have somebody airbrush the prints. I'd have to wait for the prints to come back. It was time consuming. It was expensive. I can't believe my excitement today with learning how to use a few editing apps. What I can do in a matter of two to three minutes to totally change a photo. And when I think back, back in the day of what it took, it's a miracle to me. Now, most of you never did that, but just appreciate how easy it is to edit and it's worth your while and time to learn how to do it. So if you look at this photo on the left, it was a little dark. The, um, I didn't have my phone quite level, so you can see some perspective problems here. There's some hang tags, not very attractive there and also here. Um, and the photo's generally all over a little bit dark. So just by putting that into an editing app, I was able to correct it. Now, I do almost all of my editing. Now, I'm not talking about my art, art photos. That is a whole different thing. I use all different editing apps for that. But for anything like interiors or, you know, in general, I use only two apps. I use Snapseed and I use Touch Retouch. Now, Snapseed is by Google. It's free. It works on Android and iPhone. And that is the workhorse of my editing apps. I use that probably 95% of the time. It does pretty much everything you want it to do, except it doesn't do a great job of removing unwanted objects. And for that, I use Touch Retouch. Touch Retouch is $2.99. It's worth every penny. And what Touch Retouch does is it allows you to remove things in the background in your photo that you don't want. And I find that there's sort of three general problems that we deal with. There's photo quality, and that's, you know, the photo is too light or too dark, or it's not saturated, or it's too saturated, or it's, you know, the contrast needs to be fixed. Removal of unwanted objects, which happens especially at trade shows. There's always things, exit signs, somebody's head in the background that we want to remove. And then there's oftentimes perspective problems. Even if you do everything right, you hold your phone correctly, you use your grid, you can still experience perspective problems. 
So Snapseed will take care of number one and three, and Touch Retouch will take care of number two. So let me show you a few images of how I use these. All right, so this is an image on the left that a designer friend of mine um, sent to me and asked me if I could fix this for her. So if you look at this photo, there's sort of three problems. The uh, perspective is obviously off. It looks like the house is leaning to the, um, to the right. It also looks like it's leaning backwards. There, um, the overall image is a little bit dark, but the gardens and the door are especially dark. So if you look at the image on the right, by using Snapseed, I easily fixed the perspective in Snapseed using the perspective tool. I used the Tune Image tool in Snapseed to overall lighten the image. And then I selectively lightened up the front garden here and this door, which was almost black, this was tough, it was under the eaves, to just selectively lighten just the door without affecting the things around it. So that all of this was done in Snapseed. Let me show you another one where I used two. I used both Snapseed and Touch Retouch for this one. So this was an image before editing. And you can see overall it's too dark. There's dark shadows. But there were three things in this image that I did not want to see. First of all, there's sort of an edge of a piece of artwork here. It's not adding to the photo. And for me, it's distracting. It's a detail that I don't like. There is the light cord running across the floor that was from that lamp there behind the chair. I didn't want that. And there's the edge of a stool sort of on the bottom right hand corner here. Again, it wasn't adding anything to the photo and I didn't want it. So in Snapseed, I overall lightened the image and in touch, retouch, I removed those three objects I circled. So the photo on the left, again, the original before editing, and the image on the right was after editing using just those two apps. So since I'm talking about editing, if you are interested, I have a free um, guide you can download where I actually I share my five apps that I use um, that I already talked about two of them, but I also show you exactly how I did it. So go ahead and feel free to download this at lindaholtcreative.com slash editing dash apps slash market. And this will go right to your email and you can see my apps. And then before we open it up to questions, I also just want to let you know, I've just released two new smartphone classes for interior designers and the links to both are there. One is a smartphone class. And again, it's just for interior designers because I talk about things that other smartphone classes don't talk about, such as, you know, um, shooting in complicated lighting situations, shooting when it's too dark, how to get those window treatments to look good, and things like that. And there's an Android edition um, for either Pixel or Samsung, and then there's an iPhone edition. And then the I have an editing class. It's a series of videos where I show you on my phone exactly how I do the edit and how I do each of the edits that I just showed you. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. I hope you learned something and have some things you can take away to start applying to your photos starting today. And I'm happy to open it up for any questions. Okay, so one of the questions okay. that was asked is, is it better to edit on a large screen if we can? Yes, it's off always easier. Um, I have an iPad and I have an editing service. And when somebody sends me photos to edit, I edit on my iPad, but you don't have to. I For all the photos for myself, which is, you know, 99% of what I'm posting on Instagram, I do it all on my phone. I do it in the grocery store when I'm in line. You know, with my big iPad, I have to sit down and I use my um, pencil for that. But you might want to start on, you know, on your on your iPad if you have it or your your larger device before you really sort of get the hang of it. But once you get the hang of it, it's so easy to do it right on your phone. Uh, what about tips for taking pictures of jewelry, books, clothing, like scarves and wraps? Are there okay. other tips that you might have? 
Yeah, so I go into that in detail actually in my class, but if you're doing jewelry, which is separate from everything else, um, jewelry is highly, highly reflective. So one tip I can give you for jewelry is to purchase one of them. They're called, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of them, but if you go on Amazon, oh, they're little, um, they're like white um, boxes. So all the sides are white. Photo booth. They're called photo booths. So you can put the jewelry in the photo booth. They're collapsible. They're inexpensive. You know, for jewelry, they're like a small one is like $19.99. They have uh, their daylight lighting on the top. So you can just turn it on and then you turn off all the lights in the room that you're um, photographing. And so the only thing that's lit is the jewelry in the white box and you'll get no glare on the jewelry and it'll, it'll shine and it'll look beautiful. And for the other things like scarves, um, my suggestion is just, you know, do it in natural light, um, get near a window if you can. So it'll have that again, even natural light. Uh, what about for e-commerce? Is there a difference in the photography that people could do? Um, obviously, products and merchandise, and that's yeah, specifically I mean, for an e-commerce site. Yeah, for e-commerce site, if you don't want to have a professional, invest in one of those photo booths because that's professional lighting. Um, and you can still use your smartphone. It's just you get it in a booth. The problem, the difference with, you know, when you're photographing something for your website, a product, a lamp, a, a vase that you're selling, um, the, the way a professional does it is they bring it into their studio, they put it on a white backdrop or gray or whatever you want, and they turn off all their studio lights and they light it with strobes. So with your smartphone, you don't have that scenario, I wouldn't imagine if you're listening to this webinar. So if you buy one of those photo booth boxes, you'll see them if you just Google that on Amazon and they come all different sizes. They make them six feet by six feet for the large ones. And you can put your products, your vase or whatever you're photographing directly into the photo booth. And it's it's perfect lighting on all the sides. And again, the important thing is, so you don't get reflection, is to turn off all the other lights in your studio or in the room. So the product is being, quote, professionally lit by the photo booth that you put it in. It's specifically a little tool to photograph small to medium products for your website or your store or whatever. Hopefully that answers um, the question. From your, from your expertise, mm -hmm. which iPhone works best? Um, well, I just bought the new iPhone Pro, iPhone 12 Max Pro. It is amazing. It blows everything out of the water. I cannot believe this phone. I am so excited about this phone. I think I'm getting as good or better photos than if I had the most expensive DSLR camera right now. It has so many great features. Um, the best of which is it has the night mode. So it really helps when you're in low light situations where those photos I showed you that I took at the show houses um, that was taken with an iPhone 8. And now my 12, it just, I can't believe what it does. Each time they come out with a new phone, um, the technology is so amazing. So the iPhone 12 Pro Max. And the reason why I got the Max is I did a lot of research on the camera. That Pro Max is just has a little bit bigger lenses, allows in a little more light, and you're going to get a little bit sharper photo than just the basic iPhone 12. So I think it was $200 more to get the Max Pro, but it was worth for me every bit of money. Now, I also want to say I have, and I use it just as much, I have the Samsung S20. I love, love that phone too. And again, it's a brand new phone. Um, and there are things I actually like about that phone even better than my new smartphone. Um, I think the color is actually a little bit snappier with the Samsung phone. And the other thing I love about the Samsung is it has a telephoto lens goes to 3X and the iPhone only goes to the 2.5X. So when I'm out photographing, 
I find myself wanting to use that 3x zoom lens more often than the 2x. Because if I want to use the 2x, I obviously want to, you know, get in closer and zoom in. So I go for the 3x. Both cameras are amazing. I love them both. I go out with one in each pocket and I use them both interchangeably. So, and I don't think it's so much just about, you know, whether it's, um, iPhone or my Samsung, and I actually have a Pixel too, and I haven't used that as much, but the Pixel is great. It's the new phones. Each time they release a new phone, the technology is that much better, and the phones are amazing. They really are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question, how would you shoot a basement with no natural light? <laughs> Um, if there is literally no natural light at all, it is pitch dark, you can't shoot that with your smartphone. You have to hire um, a professional to bring in lighting. However, in my class, I actually deal with this. I show how I um, photographed a um, internal bathroom with no natural light using my brand new phone, and it's pretty amazing. So try it with a night mode if you have that. Um, but otherwise, if it is truly pitch dark and there's not any light at all, then you can't turn on the lights because you you saw in that previous slide what happened when the lights were turned on. So you have to hire a professional. They'll have to bring in all sorts of lights and light the room. Uh, for realtors, for designers who might be dealing with them, what would you say to a realtor who has bad dark cell phone photography on the MLS? Um, it's bad. <laughs> How would you advise? <laughs> How would um, well, you advise them to deal with that? So I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, well, obviously they, you don't want to have dark, bad photos on your real estate listings. So you need to learn how to use your phone and get good shots if you're going to be photographing it yourself um, or, or hire a real estate photographer. But, you know, I think... It's so funny about real estate because I look at real estate all the time. It's kind of a hobby of mine. 90% of real estate photos are atrocious. And even the ones for million dollar listings, you know, they just, they're bad. And um, not only is the lighting bad, but the angle is bad. They'll, you know, shoot from weird angles. So, you know, real estate photography is very much different than interior design photography because designers want to show their style. They want to show the mood and the feel of the room where real estate photographers care about one thing. Look how big this room is. They show the ceiling, the floor, the walls, all the furniture. Things are distorted. The perspective is off. Um, but I understand why they have to do that because looking at it, you don't want to see like the corner of a sofa and beautiful wallpaper. That's not going to sell the house for you. So it's too totally different styles of shooting. But realtors um, need to learn how to use their phone um, just as designers do, so they can get good, clear, in-focus in photos. So no dark photos. That's bad. Yeah, they are bad. Um, do you have any quick tips for shooting flat lays? Is a light box the best for that? No, flat lays. Um, get it near a window if you can. No, again, look for that even lighting. You don't want to put the flat lay when the sun is, you know, barreling through that window. You can't get good lighting with that. So get it near a window. Wait till you have that um, natural um, even light and shoot it there where it's plenty of light. If you have another thing you could do, um, if you have a, a studio that has lots of available light, you can pretty much put it anywhere, on a table, on the floor. But if you don't have enough light, you need to get it to natural light. Even if it means taking it outside um, on a cloudy day where you have that sort of soft overhead lighting, um, but you don't want to shoot in with fluorescent light overhead. That's going to cast a shadow when you put your phone over the flat light to get the shot. You're going to see the shadow of your phone. So you have to turn off the overhead lights when you're shooting flat lights. And again, try and use natural even light. Um, one last question. Uh, tips for taking pictures for small powder rooms. Um, sometimes it's a small space and there are no windows. What would you suggest for the proper lighting? Um, if you, again, if you um, can't get any lighting at all and it's an internal 
um, powder room, you're going to want to hire a professional to do that because they have to bring in lights. I mean, a professional couldn't shoot a dark powder room with no lights either, but the professional will have lights they can bring in. But if there's any light at all, you can put your phone on a tripod and just do a very long exposure and see what you get. Um, I have a, I, I do that for, for my dark spaces. I put my um, smartphone on a tripod and you have to manually set the exposure and it's going to be a long exposure. It could be several seconds or, or even longer, but that way you'll get a sharp photo because if you're trying to shoot a dark bath, back bathroom and you're hand holding your phone and you're setting the exposure manually by, you know, brightening up the screen, that could be a five second exposure. And if you're hand holding that, there's no way that bathroom is going to be sharp. It's going to be very soft. So you want to invest in a tripod. So then that way, when you, you know, click the shutter for that long exposure, it will be sharp. Well, Linda, I want to thank you for just presenting today for our different audiences from, um, from Atlanta, Las Vegas, High Point, and all across the country who might be joining us. Um, your tips are valuable and they're needed. And we look forward to um, seeing better photography all across <laughs> the web. I'm gonna be watching and, next time I'm there. <laughs> absolutely. Um, for those of you who are joining us, you can definitely go to uh, Linda's website and find out more about her photography and her classes and the editing apps that she uses. Um, please join us if you're interested in our markets. Um, we are having in-person live markets. Uh, Las Vegas market is being held April 11th through 15th and registration is going on right now. And High Point market will be June 5th through 9th. And so please join us on site. Um, if you feel comfortable, if it's something that you feel you can do, if not, please visit our website. And we just want to thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye.